Peter Brimelow, who was born in Warrington, England. He received his BA at the University of Sussex and his MBA from Stanford University. He's worked as a financial journalist for numerous publications, including Toronto's Financial Post. It was while living in Canada that Peter became familiar with the political dynamics of that country, which led to his writing the book, The Patriot Game, National Dreams and Political Realities. After working in Toronto, Peter was an economic aide to Senator Orrin Hatch here in Washington, D.C. Afterwards, he worked in New York for publications such as Barron's, Fortune, and National Review. In 1999, Peter founded vdare.com, of which he is the editor today. vdare is one of the most provocative websites devoted to the issue of the national question today. From 1986 to 2002, Peter was a senior editor of Forbes magazine. His other works include Alien Nation, Common Sense about America's Immigration Disaster, the late syndicated columnist Dr. Sam Francis, writing in National Review, declared it, quote, an important contribution to American political thought, close quote. Peter lives in Connecticut with his wife Lydia and their three children. And on a personal note, I first became familiar with Peter's work through his writings in National Review, and particularly his book, Alien Nation. He continues to be one of the most thought-provoking individuals I've met. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Grimmel. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, unlike Dr. Porter, I'm still struggling with one language. Uh, <laughs> it may be that some of them, particularly, you may not be able to hear me, but in the back I gather there's some problems. If anybody can't hear me, just, just to indicate in the, in the usual way. Um, I want to thank Pro English for, uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, we're very brave for them um, for a number of reasons. We have in the back, by the way, copies of uh, the Social Contract magazine special issue, which had a lot of VDA, uh, made up of VDA material, which you can pick up for free, because I don't want to close up my office anymore. <laughs> uh, are there any Canadians in the audience? Hi. So I have to be careful. No, no, it's on News Network. Go ahead. Thank you. Say hello to Michael Paul. Um, uh, I have to be careful then. If you go, if you cross the border in Canada, you know, anywhere in, in a country, you're going to see bilingual signs in the airport. And you're going to conclude from this that uh, there's a lot of, of, uh, of bilingual and francophone people around in the country. Well, this just isn't true. Uh, as a practical matter, there are only about uh, less than a fifth of Canadians speak both languages. Uh, most of those uh, live in Quebec or it's a mutant environment. Uh, uh, that number's not changed for many years. As far back as 1931, it was 12%. So in, in spite now of nearly 50 years of intense social engineering since the Official Language Act of 67, uh, that number hasn't, hasn't, hasn't significantly <coughs> increased. And above all, there are essentially no French speakers, no bilingual uh, Canadians uh, west of the Lakehead. Uh, for 2,000 miles, there's almost no French spoken at home. At the moment, there's a bill being considered in the Canadian Parliament to make uh, it mandatory for all Supreme Court justices in Canada to be able to hear arguments in French. As it stated, it, it mustn't, it's not a question of um, uh, having translated or listened to a French la language argument. The, the judges themselves have got to, uh, have got to be French speaking, got to be bilingual. Of course, this means it's a practical matter that there are going to be no more Western Canadians uh, on, the su on the Supreme Court. Uh, and that's really its intention is to, that's the fundamental point to grasp about by the bilingualism, the institutional bilingualism. It's about power. It's about the distribution of power and purposes in the, in the society. Um, uh, Canadians, uh, the Canadians, uh, you know, uh, I lived in Canada for, as a young man and, and I wrote this book on Canadian politics. Uh, it's a really interesting, interesting society, isn't it? And, 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 they, and they're responsible for inventing a great number of modern political diseases that can affect the entire world. <laughs> uh, one of them is multiculturalism, which in a nutshell is, is the determination of the elites not to oppress immigrants to uh, assimilate, uh, as they did in the, in the early 20th century here with the, Americanized, the famous Americanization campaign, but the direct opposite, to encourage them not to assimilate. And the other is bilingualism. Uh, as I said earlier, bilingualism is fundamentally about power. People, people like to say, well, it's a great thing for people to speak more than one language. 
I think it's a hogwash myself. I, I, I've never spelled the uh, absence of more than one language. Well, I, I know that Dr. Porter would agree with me. But what I think the absence of is, is math. Is, is math. I wish I, had, I wish I was better at math than I am. But, but and I think that's very typical of the scientific world, world we, we live in. Um, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking institutional bilingualism, requiring the state and requiring institutions to function in both languages on demand. <coughs> and that's exactly what's happening in Canada. The federal government, right across the country, functions in both languages, which means the practical matter is, it is substantially staffed uh, by, by fr francophones, the, the, the term the Canadians have for French language speakers, francophones from Quebec. It's made a huge, huge difference by how we practice this. And in certain areas of the country, for example, in Newfoundland, where my first wife was from, or the west, west of the Prairie provinces, you know, a major thing that kids did in those areas, the boys, was to go into the RCMP, the, the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Mounters. Now, that's very difficult to do now because of these, uh, these bilingual requirements. Because as a practical matter, people do not learn two languages unless they're in a, uh, an environment where they hear the language is spoken, as most Canadians are not. Um, now, there are basically two ways in which you can become an institutionally bilingual society. Uh, um, one is uh, you can bring a lot of immigrants in who speak a different language uh, and, and persuade them not to assimilate. And this is what the Americans have been working on since the 1965 Immigration Act. Uh, and this has come along a long way, and they've created a whole new, new minority of Hispanics. And if you look in detail at these numbers, you see that in 1990 was the first time we saw in the U.S. Census a uh, category of native-born Americans, people born in the country, over the age of 40, who couldn't speak English. Never been picked up before in, in, in the census. Uh, um, there's a, they have another concept, what uh, the census do, they call it linguistic isolation, the number of families where nobody speaks English, uh, or over the age of 40. And when I last looked in 2003, uh, the 2010 census, uh, that number had doubled, and now it appears to have doubled again. So we are just steadily working on building our foreign language enclaves in this country. Now, the second way in which you can, uh, you can uh, move to a bilingual society is to have a large part of your territory that's entirely inhabited by people who don't speak uh, the majority language and refuse to learn it and don't want to learn it. And the, the Canadians had this, of course, in Quebec where essentially, uh, uh, for practical purposes, all the Francophones in, in, in Canada live uh, 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 in, in, the, in the province of Quebec. Quebec is a nation state in every sense, except uh, political independence. And it's very close to that. It's, it's, slow, it's working on that now. Um, and it was, the Canadian elite, for one reason or other, was desperate to keep it in, keep it in, 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 in confederation. So they decided to bribe it with this official language policy, which created jobs all across the country for Francophones. Uh, and also had um, uh, serious consequences on the political consequences for the political discourse. Now the Americans are working on that too, of course, but by uh, the idea of, with the idea of making Puerto, of bringing Puerto Rico into the union and making it a state, which, as far as I can see, every single uh, Republican presidential candidate is in favour of, not having it given, given it two seconds thought, of course. Uh, if, if, if Puerto Rico comes into the a union as a state. I don't see, uh, under the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution, how it's going to be possible to stop institutional bilingualism spreading right across the country. And we have an article on vida.com about this uh, this morning. Um, okay, well. The, the, uh, the react so the demographic realities in Canada are that th th about 17% of the population speaks, uh, speaks uh, both languages. Uh, over half of those are, are, are actually Francophones, they speak French in their homes. One out of every three uh, uh, Francophones is bilingual in the official languages. Only one out of 15 is by, uh, of the Anglophones are, are bilingual. So it's a highly asymmetrical uh, situation. Um, I said earlier on that it, that it has a, 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 bad, a, a serious effect on political discourse. When the Official Language Act was passed, it immediately became sacred. It was bitterly opposed, but that once it's passed, it becomes sacrosanct, and it's impossible for any public figure really to criticize uh, the Official Language Act in Canada. In the early 1970s, uh, I was a columnist with the Financial Post in Canada, and a young man came to see me who was running for the, the Conservative leadership. Uh, the Progressive Conservative Leadership, the equivalent of the Republican Party. And I asked him a question about the then fashionable issue of um, uh, free trade between the US and Canada. 
Now, this was, uh, this was uh, again, a very old-fashioned issue. In, uh, it, was, it was a hot issue, but it was fiercely opposed by the Canadian nationalists. This fellow immediately fell apart. He said, uh, frankly, he didn't know anything about free trade, which is only the most important economic issue that's faced Canada for its entire history. He said he didn't know anything about it because when he went into politics, he had to choose between learning French and learning economics. And he says, and I chose French. <laughs> he was from Western Canada. And, and you know, to learn a language so you can function and debate it as adults is no it means task. It's very, it's very time consuming, assuming. So I'm not surprised in the time I had fairy tales. So anyway, I promptly lost interest in him. And he went on to be the leader, win the leadership, and become Prime Minister of Canada. His name was Joe Clark. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I think that it did have a bad effect on that debate. Because, you know, at the time he said that to me, in the middle 1970s, none of you will remember this now, not even Bob. Uh, but, you know, socialism was really on the march there. Everybody thought that we were going to move to a permanent, permanent socialized society, permanent wage and price controls. Nixon had introduced wage and price controls here. Trudeau had given a speech saying the free market system doesn't work, we have to have wage and price controls. We really thought we were going to move all the way to a social democratic state. And nobody was opposing it, least of all, of course, Joe, Joe Clark, who just went along with the flow. It's hard to remember that now, because it's all been blown away by the great inflation of the early 1980s and so on, and by Ronald Reagan, God rest him. But uh, 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 it, it, in Canada, it was very slow to get that message, and one reason was because of the way in which their political debate is so messed up by this, uh, this language stuff. Um, I said that, uh, that Canada is a warning, and, and the idea that you would pose uh, uh, official, uh, official bilingualism on, on the federal institutions or even state institutions is a terrible thing. Uh, and it will it re lead to the dispossession of uh, the people who don't want uh, uh, bilingual. And in Canada, it's been highly regressive. It's meant really that powers remain in the hands of, uh, of Central Canada when, when the uh, demographic suggestion should be really moving to the West. And Quebec, of course, which is still falling in the share of the national population. Uh, it's had a highly regressive social effect because it means basically that the governments and the Canadian elite institutes are all staffed by the same types of people, namely uh, Anglophone, bilinguals, typically from Montreal uh, or Quebec in the, in the Central Canadian region. Just as Charles Moore has just written a book saying that our elites here are getting out of touch with the majority, uh, that's enhanced in Canada by the power of the, of the official language policy. Well, there is also something very good about Canadian uh, language policy, which I didn't think so at the time, which is that the Quebecers pay absolutely no attention to it, whatever. They, they uh, uh, although the federal government institutions in Canada, Quebec work in French and English, uh, uh, the Quebec government institutions work entirely in French. And, and over a period of, uh, of several years in the 70s and early 80s, successive governments in Quebec passed legislation which essentially crushed the use of English in, in Quebec. Uh, you could not hire, you could not require uh, 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 an employee to, to, to speak English in Quebec um, uh, um, under, under most circumstances. You couldn't even display signs uh, in English in Quebec. So that, for example, if you go to an English ra ra uh, language bookstore in Montreal, you see this, a sign will say roman, it means novel. Or the, the novels on the sign, roman, but the sign itself is in French. And it does have this subliminal effect that you see in reverse when you go to, uh, into Vancouver Airport. You, you forget about the presence of the Anglos in Quebec and in Montreal, although that's the city which they, they, they essentially built. It was an English-speaking city until very recently. Uh, I think that this uh, example of what the Quebecers have done, although it's not pretty, and it, uh, it, it's most interesting because it has actually completely broken the back of Anglophone resistance to, to Quebec separatism. If, if people don't like Quebec separatism, they've, they've left Montreal now. There's a community of, uh, of Anglos in Quebec who are uh, bilingual. In fact, they're the most bilingual of all the ethnic groups in Canada. But they tend to be quite sympathetic to separatism. They, they, you know, in a generation, the, the, the Montreal have been there. You know, it's the city with the greatest number of road signs to Queen Victoria in the world. Uh, uh, and now it's a French-speaking city. In, in uh, 50, 60 years, the Montreal Anglos have gone from being Romans to being Anglo-Argentinians. They, they, there's a small trace of, uh, they have ethnic patterns and so on, social life is slightly different from the rest, but they're still essentially uh, uh, assimilated. I think that something like that is going to have to be done here. It's not enough to have a, official English at the government level. I get email all the time from people in eastern, eastern Washington state and places like this who say that kids, kids can't, you know, kids can't get jobs in McDonald's and places like that because they don't speak, they don't speak Spanish. Uh, 
And uh, so that essentially, it's a ferocious attack upon the uh, living standards of the of American working class and blue collar workers, just as immigration policy in general is. Uh, I will finish up with a, a hopeful anecdote, though. Uh, uh, my first wife, uh, as I told you, uh, um, who died, and some of you knew it, who died uh, some years ago, uh, was from Newfoundland, which is an island in the, in the Atlantic. It's sort of a saltwater Appalachia, really. Uh, and no friend at all is spoken there. Uh, but she was completely bilingual. And she was bilingual because her father, uh, uh, that is to say, in the Canadian, Canadian terms, it means she speaks French and English. Uh, it, she and her father, like all Canadians, I thought it would be a good idea to work with the federal government. And, and um, uh, had, you know, got pushed it through French in, in school. Uh, so she was completely bilingual. But it had absolutely no effect. It didn't do what they thought it was going to do. It had absolutely no effect at all on her attitudes to Quebec uh, and, and her tolerance for and all this stuff. Uh, she retained all the traditional Newfoundland attitudes to Quebec, which is to say she thought they were all thieves and should give, <laughs> <laughs> and should give back the Churchill Falls, which is a, it's a great rip-off on the Newfoundland taxpayer, the Churchill Falls, which uh, is, is rather arcane. I'll talk about it later. Um, Basically, they can't get power out of the Church of Falls except through Quebec, and the Quebecers have stolen all the money. They, 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 there's a deal on what they can pay for it. Um, the only practical effect of her speaking French was that we had to go to Paris every year. And she was, in fact, living in Paris when, when I married her. Uh, I had to come to Washington, which she didn't actually forgive me for. for all the time. Uh, the moral is it doesn't work, you know. He's got these great social engineering problems that don't work. And even though Joe Clark was a completely useless prime minister, even as nearly as bad as uh, George W. Bush. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the fact is, there is a Quebec. Uh, there, there, there is a Quebec government now that has been elected predominantly from English Canada. It does not. It, it does, does not require uh, Quebec vote to win. They've assembled a majority out of English Canada alone. Something which I predicted in my Canadian book. Uh, 25 years ago would eventually happen. Now, they haven't actually done very much about it because, of course, they're still under the ideological pressure, the ideological hegemony of the, of the, the liberals and the official language uh, myth. Uh, but it's going to happen. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.